Hey everyone, Anarch here. Today's video will continue the analysis that began in the first part of our video series called The State is Counter-Revolutionary. In part one, we explored why the state is an inherently counter-revolutionary and anti-socialist institution from a theoretical standpoint, and then outlined what ideological trends led to its emergence in the left. In this part, we will trace the progression of the Leninist method as it was first practiced in the USSR, and demonstrate its material impact as a justifying ideology. In part three, we will trace the continuation of this ideological approach as it manifested in Mao's China, inspecting how Mao's revisions were still insufficient to stop the state from eventually overwhelming worker control. This second and third part of the series are very important, I believe, because the temptation of the authoritarian ideology lies within a belief that it's seen success when implemented. However, what we'll demonstrate here is that the success of these projects is not the success of socialism, but instead a demonstration that a statist model of centralization and military conformity is part of a successful method of hoarding power for a privileged ruling class. When understood through this lens, longevity becomes trivial. No one was in doubt that a central vanguard party could properly seize control and overthrow a previous central dictator. This is how every bourgeois revolution is carried out, after all. The conversation at hand is whether this method can bring about worker control of society. And as we shall see, it cannot. So this is part two of The State is counter-revolutionary. In part one, we offered a series of foundational critiques and outlined some of the anarchist theory which helped explain the state as an entity. We also listened as Rosa Luxemburg, a contemporary of Lenin, critiqued the foundations of his ideology and expressed her skepticism of his organizing ethos. However, the anarchist Mikhail Bakunin saw much further than this. We have left his predictions for this video because I'd like for them to stay fresh in your mind as we proceed. Bakunin did not even have to read Lenin to know what kind of expediency was on its way. Indeed, he could see the embryonic justifications within Marx. For example, in 1869, nearly 50 years before the USSR even came into existence, he said, The dictatorship of the proletariat. In reality, it would be for the proletariat a barrack regime where the standardized mass of men and women workers would wake, sleep, work, and live to the beat of a drum for the clever and learned a privilege of governing, and for the mercenary-minded, attracted by the state bank, a vast field of lucrative jobbery. Then, later in 1873, the leaders of the Communist Party, namely Mr. Marx and his followers, will concentrate the reins of government in a strong hand. They will centralize all commercial, industrial, agricultural, and even scientific production, and then divide the masses into two armies, industrial and agricultural, under the direct command of state engineers, who will constitute a new privileged scientific and political class. How is it, given the evolution we discussed in Marx's ideology over the course of his life, that Bakunin was able to foresee this threat so clearly? Well, it's perhaps not because Bakunin accurately understood Marx, but instead because Marx had chosen a terminology which obscured his desires. It didn't matter if, after dissection and distinction, Marx wasn't an authoritarian. In speaking of dictatorships of the proletariat and workers' states, Marx had allowed the political language of the authoritarians to form his rhetoric that later authoritarians might then transform that rhetoric into justification for their power is not shocking. 
This is, in fact, what has come to be called the linguistic turn in Russia. In this view, then, Bakunin's critiques are being levied against the risk of what Marx's ideology might become if appropriated by a centralized state. After all, Bakunin and other contemporary anarchists recognized quite deeply that if socialism is worker ownership and control of the means of production, then the state, a centralized, top-down power structure which seeks the monopoly of violence, is inherently in opposition to socialism. Any bureaucracy that domineers the workers, directing their work, setting their compensation, and deciding their production and distribution, inevitably reproduces a class system, no matter what aesthetics it uses. Keep these predictions by Bakunin and the inspections of the last video in mind as we proceed through this part and the next. Each will be vindicated in full in both projects. In the year 1917, Russia was deep in the despair of World War I. Although the conflict had originally been a rallying cry that served to distract the masses from their suffering under Tsar Nicholas II, soldiers were now returning home from a pointless, traumatizing conflict only to find their wives and breadlines and large groups of the industrial workforce now engaged in early conflict with the state. Both the peasantry and the urban proletariat had lost faith in the regime. The combination of war weariness, brewing dissatisfaction with the very institution of monarchy, and food shortages had driven the populace into mass strikes and riots. The government itself was fractured due to a series of foolish decisions. As inflation rose, as war threatened the ability of the Russian market to access the world, the people of the nation were at a breaking point. That breaking point would come to be called the February Revolution. By the end of February 1917, Tsar Nicholas II, his troops having abandoned him and the masses having joined together to oppose him, abdicated the throne. Following this, a provisional government was created, led by a man named Alexander Kerensky. But this government was not to last either. Already, inspired by socialist theory, the workers had begun creating a variety of direct democratic bodies and trade unions. And although they took many forms, we will call the direct democratic bodies factory committees, and we will call the broader hierarchical representative organizations trade unions from here on out. The distinction is meaningful. These factory committees were not mere unions. They were not managed by an internal hierarchy, and they did not just seek to negotiate with the workplace owners. They sought to collectively become the workplace owners. These factory committees often seized the means of production from capitalist control and proceeded to institute direct worker control through democratic means, whereas the trade unions were structured through internal elections and acted as bargaining bodies between the workers and the workplace owners. During this period, mechanisms of direct worker control were being created so fast that the citizens had essentially built the dual power structures that would rival the power of the state. Maurice Brinton explicates this in his work, The Bolsheviks and Workers' Control. Soviets and factory committees were appearing everywhere at a phenomenal rate. Their growth can be explained by the extremely radical nature of the tasks confronting the working class. Soviets and committees were far more closely associated with the realities of everyday life than were the unions. They therefore proved far more effective mouthpieces of fundamental popular aspirations. Even the historian E. H. Carr, a scholar who has demonstrated an affinity for the Bolsheviks in the past, had to admit of this period. 
The spontaneous inclination of the workers to organize factory committees and to intervene in the management of the factories was inevitably encouraged by a revolution which led the workers to believe that the productive machinery of the country belonged to them and could be operated by them at their own discretion and to their own advantage. This is to say, throughout this period, the workers were not under the impression that the bodies they were creating were supposed to prefigure a vanguard rulership. They were, instead, intent upon directly configuring socialist property relations. Indeed, at the very first national meeting of the factory committees in 1917, this spirit of self-determination and bottom-up control was unmistakable in their statement that the factory committees themselves should emanate all instructions concerning internal factory organization, including hours of work, wages, hiring and firing, holidays, etc. This was echoed clearly in the anarcho-syndicalist magazine Golos Truda, saying the people demanded total workers' control, embracing all plant operations, real and not fictitious control, control over work rules, hiring and firing, hours and wages, and the procedures of manufacture. The Bolsheviks, while maintaining views that centralization was necessary, could not be seen to be in opposition to such a state of affairs so long as the revolution was still underway. The factory committees were the fighting bodies of the economic insurrection. The Bolsheviks would even make public statements that the factory committees were the battering ram that would deal blows to capitalism, organs of class struggle created by the working class on its own ground. Under such conditions of mass worker agitation and direct control, the Bolsheviks swept into an electoral majority, and by October of that same year, the provisional government was overthrown in what is now called the October Revolution. Meanwhile, internal enemy forces, what came to be called the White Army, were beginning to form, and the Russian Civil War was brewing. So too were the foreshocks of the Bolshevik sabotage of worker control and the suppression of dissent rumbling at foot. Shortly after the revolution, at the second All-Russian Congress of Soviets, a Bolshevik spokesman was already at work attempting to bring the workers into obedience to the party, saying, New laws will be proclaimed within a few days dealing with the workers' problems. One of the most important will deal with workers' control of production and with the return of industry to normal conditions. Strikes and demonstrations are harmful in Petrograd. We ask you to put an end to all strikes on economic and political issues, to resume work, and to carry it out in a perfectly orderly manner. Every man to his place. The best way to support the Soviet government these days is to carry on with one's job. Indeed, the USSR existed for scarcely a single month before Lenin's draft decrees were issued dark foreshadowing of the ultimate dissolution of the factory committees, and thus any hope for Russian socialism. Although it could have been missed, given that Lenin's first decree solidified what the factory committees had already achieved through struggle prior to the October Revolution, a deadly poison was included within it, namely that the decisions of the elected delegates of the workers and employees were legally binding upon the owners of enterprises. However, they could be annulled by trade unions and congresses. Further, Lenin's decree declared that in all enterprises of state importance, all delegates from the factory committees were answerable to the state for the maintenance of the strictest order and discipline and for the protection of property. And what qualified as enterprises of importance to the state? All enterprises working for defense purposes or in any way connected with the production of articles necessary for the existence of the masses of the population. If these extremely broad requirements were met, any delegate appointed by the workers could be dismissed by the Bolsheviks, 
and thus management by the workers became utterly subverted to the state machinery. This may seem to have been something utilitarian given the possibility of reaction. However, it can be seen that it was carried out very consciously with the intention to dissolve worker control and thus to sabotage the brief existence of socialist economic conditions in Russia. Lozovsky, a Bolshevik trade unionist, made very clear, The lower organs of control must confine their activities within the limits set by the instructions of the proposed All-Russian Council of Workers' Control. We must say it quite clearly and categorically, so that the workers in various enterprises don't go away with the idea that the factories belong to them. But the factory committees did not intend to go down without a fight. Just after the revolution, they attempted to form their own national organization, meant to establish these directly democratic worker bodies as the rightful managers of the economy. Here too we see the precursor of a form of anti-socialism beginning. The Bolsheviks, for the first time, worked to pit the trade unions against the factory committees. The trade unions, more hierarchical and thus easier to co-opt, would become the preferred worker body for the Bolsheviks as time went on. Thus they called on the trade unions to renounce the factory committees and to call for full submission to the Bolshevik party. The trade unions, as they would do repeatedly in the years to come, obliged. A deal made with the devil that they would eventually come to regret. By next year, Lenin produced an article outlining the intentions of the Bolsheviks proceeding forward. In this article, he explained a need for raising labor discipline, by which he meant that there should be an emulation of the American capitalist form of labor control called Taylorism. In fact, he said it plainly. We must raise the question of applying much of what is scientific and progressive in the Taylor system. The Soviet Republic must, at all costs, adopt all that is valuable in the achievements of science and technology in this field. We must organize in Russia the study and teaching of the Taylor system. Such a system included strict measurement of every worker's productivity, staunch regulations, and a rate of output bureau which would report and enforce output quotas for every worker. In enacting such a system, literally formed by the managerial philosophy of capitalism and attendant with a brutal subjugation of the workers, the system of state capitalism was configured in a most coherent and explicit fashion. Lenin said without compunction that, Today the revolution demands, in the interests of socialism, that the masses unquestioningly obey the single will of the leaders of the labor process. In correspondence with the height of the Civil War, the industries which were now conceived of as being affected by the need of unquestioning submission, and thus would be summarily expropriated from the workers, were to include the mining, metallurgical, textile, electrical, timber, tobacco, resin, glass and pottery, leather and cement industries, all steam-driven mills, local utilities, and private railways. In this process, all industries were taken out of the hands of the workers. And now, within the course of barely a year, the workers were already turned into nothing more than military servants. Everything became a supply chain for the front, not at their own direction, but at the demand of the central apparatus. And although it might seem tempting, in light of the pressures of the war, to claim that this was needed in order to fight the White Army, Maurice Brinton points out that this period witnessed a considerable fall in production due to a complex variety of factors which have been well described elsewhere. The trouble was often blamed, however, by party spokesmen on the influence of heretical anarcho-syndicalist ideas. While it may be true that popular aspirations held similarities to anarcho-syndicalist ideas, the anarcho-syndicalists as a faction had little formal power left by this point. The Bolsheviks had crushed the power of the factory committees, and the anarchist press was being actively dismantled. The anarchist contingent of Russia was being forcefully driven into obscurity. 
the syndicalists, which had done much of the work organizing the factory committees which waged the Russian Revolution before 1917, now had to flee to groups like workers' opposition, the socialist revolutionaries, or choose to agitate as non-party workers, at constant risk of suppression by the Cheka. That the Bolshevik centralization and brutal crushing of worker control so quickly after the revolution may have led to a loss of enthusiasm among the masses of laborers, and that that subjugation led to the drop in production, was an idea the state simply could not entertain. Instead, the workers and their desire for worker control had to be turned into a heresy. Every time that popular support for socialist policies arose, it would be called anarchist, syndicalist, or counter-revolutionary as an excuse to suppress it. But the socialism that the Russian workers fought to produce was one which afforded the workers the freedom to direct their labor, and they only tolerated its suspension temporarily. Such a proletarian consciousness, with its practical through-line to syndicalist ideology, represented an existential threat to state monopoly, and thus had to be destroyed at all costs. On August 25th of 1918, at the first all-Russian conference of anarcho-syndicalists, they would not mince words. The Bolshevik party was betraying the working class with its suppression of workers' control in favor of such capitalist devices as one-man management, labor discipline, and the employment of bourgeois engineers and technicians. By forsaking the factory committees, the beloved child of the Great Workers' Revolution, for those dead organizations, the trade unions, and by substituting decrees and red tape for industrial democracy, the Bolshevik leadership is creating a monster of state capitalism, a bureaucratic behemoth which it ludicrously calls socialism. Other anarchists were more measured in their assessment. Brinton paraphrases an article seen in the anarcho-syndicalist magazine Volny Golostruda, which was established after Golostruda was forcefully shut down by the Bolsheviks earlier that year. In this assessment, Lenin and his followers were not necessarily cold-blooded cynics who, with Machiavellian cunning, had mapped out the new class structure in advance to satisfy their personal lust for power. Quite possibly, they were motivated by a genuine concern for human suffering. But the division of society into administrators and workers followed inexorably from the centralization of authority. It could not be otherwise. Once the functions of management and labor had become separated, the former assigned to a minority of experts and the latter to the untutored masses, all possibility of dignity or equality were destroyed. However, it didn't matter that they had taken this moderate tone. Volny Golos Truda was shut down by the Cheka after five issues. Even some fellow anarchists called them anarcho-bureaucratic Judases for daring to question the Bolsheviks. But such condemnations would ring hollow. By autumn, the National Soviet was completely absorbed into the state. It had no more meetings, and the last direct mechanism of control for the factory committees was therefore dead. What remained for workers who wished to steer the ship of the Russian machine were the trade unions, but they were already a ghost of their former selves. Vast numbers of delegates that had been appointed by the workers had already been annulled by the Bolsheviks. Brinton recounts an event in which the Bolshevik politician Vyacheslav Molotov underwent an analysis of the composition of these delegates. Of 400 persons concerned, over 10% were former employers or employers' representatives. 9% technicians, 38% officials from various departments, including the central state, and the remaining 43% workers or representatives of workers' organizations, including trade unions. The management of production was predominantly in the hands of persons having no relation to the proletarian elements in industry. The delegate bodies had to be regarded as organs in no way corresponding to the proletarian dictatorship. Those who directed policy were employers' representatives, technicians, and specialists. 
It was indisputable that the Soviet bureaucrat of these early years was, as a rule, a former member of the bourgeois intelligentsia or official class, and brought with him many of the traditions of the old Russian bureaucracy. It was not only Molotov who discovered such a thing either. Britain recounts other independent sources who verify the same facts. A Congress delegate, Cherkin, claimed for instance that, although in most regions there were institutions representing the trade union movement, these institutions were not elected or ratified in any way. Where elections had been conducted and individuals elected who were not suitable to the needs of the central council or local powers, the elections had been annulled very freely and the individuals replaced by others more subservient to the administration. Another delegate, Perkin, spoke out against new regulations which required that representatives sent by workers' organizations to the Commissariat of Labor be ratified by the Commissariat. If at a union meeting we elect a person as a commissar, i.e. if the working class is allowed in a given case to express its will, one would think that this individual would be allowed to represent our interests in the commissariat, would be our commissar. But no, in spite of the fact that we've expressed our will, the will of the working class, it is still necessary for the commissar we have elected to be confirmed by the authorities. The proletariat is allowed the right to make a fool of itself. Such an arrangement, as has been laid out here, has no similarity to socialism. And indeed, contrary to those who uncritically praise the USSR, Lenin himself made no such claim. In his economics and politics in the era of the dictatorship of the proletariat, he said, Socialism means the abolition of classes. The dictatorship of the proletariat has done all it could to abolish classes, but classes cannot be abolished at one stroke, and classes still remain and will remain in the era of the dictatorship of the proletariat. The dictatorship will become unnecessary when classes disappear. Without the dictatorship of the proletariat, they will not disappear. Yet, even this admission was an act of bare propaganda. What Lenin and the Bolsheviks had transfigured here bore no resemblance to Marx's dictatorship of the proletariat, as we spoke about in Part 1. Instead, what we can see is that Bakunin's most dire concerns had come to be realized. The USSR was now, for the proletariat, a barrack regime where the standardized mass of men and women workers would wake, sleep, work, and live to the beat of a drum. The red flags, the fawning praise for Marxist theory, and all other considerations were mere aesthetics. Worker control had become a propagandistic figment, a promise not only unfulfilled, but actively betrayed by Bolshevik power. Lenin's later statement that the syndicalist deviation leads to the fall of the dictatorship of the proletariat can really be interpreted as the demands of the workers to control the means of production requires the dissolution of the state. A fact that it is unfortunate a more sizable majority of the populace did not recognize. Malatesta, watching from afar in Spain, could also see what was taking place in 1919 when he said, What we have is the dictatorship of one party, or rather, of one party's leaders. A genuine dictatorship, with its decrees, its penal sanctions, its henchmen, and, above all, its armed forces, which are, at present, also deployed in the defense of the revolution against its external enemies, but which will tomorrow be used to impose the dictator's will upon the workers, to apply a break on revolution, to consolidate the new interests in the process of emerging, and protect a new privileged class against the masses. He could not even have known how right he was, not tomorrow, as he said, but at the very moments he made this statement. And although those who seek to make excuses for this Bolshevik counter-revolution may have claimed that it was necessary to consolidate a military discipline to defeat the White Army, by 1920 the Civil War was essentially over. Indeed, very little resistance remained of the White Army or any interlocutors. Yet, as Brenton recounts, 
At the gathering of the Bolshevik faction, Lenin and Trotsky together urge acceptance of the militarization of labor. Only two of 60 or more Bolshevik trade union leaders support them. Never before had Trotsky or Lenin met with so striking a rebuff. Trotsky, however, was known to have said that the working class cannot be left wandering all over Russia. They must be thrown here and there, appointed, commanded, just like soldiers. Compulsion of labor will reach the highest degree of intensity during the transition from capitalism to socialism. Deserters from labor ought to be formed into punitive battalions or put into concentration camps. Then, later in the year, as the workers were becoming angered at their treatment, the militarization of labor is the indispensable basic method for the organization of our labor forces. And, is it true that compulsory labor is always unproductive? This is the most wretched and miserable liberal prejudice. Chattel slavery too was productive. Compulsory slave labor was, in its time, a progressive phenomenon. Labor, obligatory for the whole country, compulsory for every worker, is the basis of socialism. Although it's popular to despise Trotsky as some sort of unique tyrant, he was saying nothing that most of the Bolsheviks didn't believe themselves and weren't enacting on a daily basis. Trotsky merely spoke in less propagandistic language than the rest of them, veiled his intentions under less deception. In doing so, he explicated Bakunin's other prediction that the centralist tendency will centralize all commercial, industrial, agricultural, and even scientific production, and then divide the masses into two armies, industrial and agricultural, under the direct command of state engineers, who will constitute a new privileged scientific and political class. By March of 1921, the Civil War was officially over, but the state capitalist configuration of the economy had not changed at all. After enduring several years of so-called war communism, the workers had begun to realize the sacrifices they made in the name of centralization and were beginning to agitate widely. Tired of suppression in the opposition parties, they built a movement as non-party workers and demanded a return to the ideals of the revolution. At this point, if one is trying to read the Bolshevik dissolution of worker control and the Russian Revolution as motivated by material conditions, it would be appropriate to expect that this would have been the right time to hand control back over to the workers. Indeed, if this were a dictatorship of the proletariat in any way, this is the precise juncture at which the state would have attempted to dissolve itself. But quite the opposite of this took place at the Tenth Party Congress. Instead, Lenin proposed the banning of all political parties, and thus a final consolidation of power in the state. The non-party workers' movement was a final threat that had to be destroyed. Mass arrests and suppression followed. But even this did not defeat the spirit of the workers to take back their revolution. In Petrograd, spurred by extremely long workdays, by unheated homes, by lack of food, anger at the inequality of the rations between workers and party bureaucrats, by the decisions of the Tenth Party Congress, and a complete absence of remuneration from the Bolsheviks, workers began mass strikes and protests. They were tired of being treated like empty automatons, especially if they would experience little material benefit for having suffered to defeat the White Army. The strikers released a statement as follows. A complete change is necessary in the policies of the government. First of all, the workers and peasants need freedom. They don't want to live by the decrees of the Bolsheviki. They want to control their own destinies. We demand the liberation of all arrested socialists and non-partisan workingmen, abolition of martial law, freedom of speech, press and assembly for all who labor, free election of shop and factory committees, of labor union and Soviet representatives. Alexander Berkman, still present in Russia during these movements, reported that the workers were being arrested in mass by the Bolsheviks, and that any of the trade unions who were still radical enough to participate were being dissolved by the government. Meanwhile, at Kronstadt, a key naval base, tensions were rising. These Kronstadt sailors were not some fringe contingent. 
In fact, they had been implemental in the success of the Bolsheviks during the early days of the revolution, called the pride and glory of the Russian Revolution by Trotsky himself. But after they sent a delegation to survey what was taking place with the striking workers and seeing how the state was doing everything it could to dismantle the revolt, they issued a statement outlining their demands in solidarity with the strikers. Berkman recounted the mood as follows. Great nervous tension in the city. The strikes continue. Labor disorders have again taken place in Moscow. A wave of discontent is sweeping the country. Peasant uprisings are reported from Tambov, Siberia, the Ukraine, and Caucasus. The country is on the verge of desperation. It was confidently hoped that, with the end of civil war, the communists would mitigate the severe military regime. The government had announced its intention of economic reconstruction, and the people were eager to cooperate. They looked forward to the lightening of the heavy burdens, the abolition of wartime restrictions, and the introduction of elemental liberties. The fronts are liquidated, but the old policies continue, and labor militarization is paralyzing industrial revival. It is openly charged that the Communist Party is more interested in entrenching its political power than in saving the revolution. An official manifesto appeared today, it is signed by Lenin and Trotsky and declares Kronstadt guilty of mutiny. The demand of the sailors for free Soviets is denounced as a counter-revolutionary conspiracy against the proletarian republic. Members of the Communist Party are ordered into the mills and factories to rally the workers to the support of the government against the traitors. Kronstadt is to be suppressed. Correspondence shows that Kronstadt sent word that we want no bloodshed, not a single communist has been harmed by us. The Bolsheviks did not care, however. Such an affront had filled their eyes with blood. Trotsky released a statement that said, The workers have come out with dangerous slogans. They have made a fetish of democratic principles. They have placed the workers' right to elect representatives above the party as if the party were not entitled to assert its dictatorship, even if that dictatorship temporarily clashed with the passing mood of the workers' democracy. Berkman, again on March 7th. Distant rumbling reaches my ears as across the Nevsky. It sounds again, stronger and nearer, as if rolling toward me. All at once, I realize that artillery is being fired. It is 6 p.m., Kronstadt has been attacked. And then, days of anguish and cannonading. My heart is numb with despair. Something has died within me. The people on the streets look bowed with grief, bewildered. No one trusts himself to speak. The thunder of heavy guns rends the air. Ten days later, he writes in his diary, Kronstadt has fallen today. Thousands of sailors and workers lie dead in its streets. Summary execution of prisoners and hostages continues. Berkman notes on March 18th the irony that the victors are celebrating the anniversary of the Commune of 1871. Trotsky and Zinoviev denounce tears in Galifay for the slaughter of the Paris rebels. After the Bolsheviks slaughtered the strikers, they went on to smear the Kronstadt sailors and all those who took part in the mass demonstrations as being inside plotters who were trying to coup the government. Once more, anarchism is associated with the revolutionary demands of socialism by Lenin when he calls the worker revolts petty bourgeois, syndicalist, anarchist, caused in part by the entry into the ranks of the party of elements which had still not completely adopted the communist worldview. But the reality of the matter didn't escape the people. During the years of 1921 to 1922 would come the first of two enormous spikes in suicide rates among communists in Russia. In 1923, M. Reisner wrote, It's hardest of all for the revolutionary romantics. The vision of a golden age unfolded so close to them. Their hearts burned out, and sad stories are circulating. 
Here, one of our war heroes went home and shot himself. He couldn't stand vile little squabbles any longer. One drop in the cup overflowed. By 1923, even Lenin recognized that the dream of socialism had died in Russia, and that it was the fault of the bureaucratic domination of the workers. Maurice Meisner, in a work which we will use extensively in the next part of this video series, recounts this story. Less than five years after the Russian Revolution, Lenin pondered why the new Soviet order had quickly become so bureaucratic and oppressive. On his deathbed, he somberly concluded that he had witnessed the resurrection of the old czarist bureaucracy to which the Bolsheviks had given only a Soviet veneer. Lenin's worst fears were soon realized with the massive bureaucratization of the Soviet state and society during the Stalinist era, and the unleashing of what Isaac Deutscher called an almost permanent orgy of bureaucratic violence. In these same deathbed reflections, Lenin said he was guilty before the workers of Russia for having not warned them about the ruthless concentration of power sooner. Of course, it would not have mattered if he had told them or not. As soon as the first decrees by Lenin had been issued which allowed the state to nationalize anything which could be deemed pertinent to the state, he had, himself, set the stage to destroy the revolution. It's cold comfort to the martyred workers that he lamented those mistakes. In the years to follow, suppression not only persisted but escalated prolifically. Economic control would never return to the embryonic socialism of 1917. Quite the contrary, the Bolsheviks would carry out a series of five-year market experiments, and in doing so, the USSR would sacrifice even its questionably revolutionary state centralization and begin a slow decline back into traditional capitalist property relations. Indeed, the institutions of the new economic plan would prove so discouraging for the Russian revolutionaries that between 1924 to 1926, there would be a doubling of the level of suicides that had occurred after Kronstadt seven times the average for party communists and 15 times the average for those in the Red Army. It's hard to blame the Russian revolutionaries for such hopelessness. All means of forcing the leadership of the USSR to meet the needs of the people and to fulfill their vanguard promises had failed. While the workers suffered miserably and fought valiantly to safeguard the revolution, the Bolsheviks crushed their dreams of socialism under heel and ruthlessly turned back all the progress that had been made toward worker control. The state, an inherently centralized entity made even more centralized by Leninist mutation of Marxist rhetoric, had suffocated the birth of revolutionary socialism in Russia. And it was not only domestic. The USSR would go on to sabotage the anarchists who had enacted socialism in Civil War Spain, to invade the free territories of Ukraine, to attempt repeated destruction of the market socialism of Yugoslavia, and to undermine almost every single other place where actual worker control was enacted during its lifetime. The Soviet state could tolerate only unquestioning submission, and was therefore second only to the United States in its sabotage of worker movements during the 20th century. But, even after all of this, one might be tempted to imagine, what if the ideology of the rulers in the central apparatus was of a sort which actually made an attempt to dissolve and dismantle bureaucracy? What if we applied some of the anarchist critiques of the state, but didn't abandon the notion completely. Our next video, Inspecting Revolutionary China, will serve to answer such questions. As we shall see, even with the ostensibly anti-bureaucratic and unorthodox approach of Mao Zedong, no amount of recuperation can ever solve the inherent antagonisms between the workers and the state. It's not a matter of which leader sits in the seat of power. The seat of power itself is the enemy to the proletarian revolution. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you want to help spread the work I'm doing here, 
click the like button, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment below. Also, if you want to help me eat and pay the bills, become a patron at the Patreon link below. Anyway, I'll see you next time.